since at least the Middle Ages, it's been argued that what truly stands between servility and freedom is education. That to be rich, powerful, or even faithfully religious can prove inadequate in the face of the freedom that metaphysical understanding and even the knowledge of physics can ultimately provide. Ipsa scientitia potestas est, knowledge itself is power. Indeed, the liberal arts were conceived as that base of knowledge fit for a free person and, in turn, the very knowledge that makes the free person truly free. But such education never comes easy, especially in the medieval world. Universities were distant instruction, rarely available in the vernacular, books were astronomically expensive, and the topics were actually marked by mostly rote memorization and commentary upon commentary with little room for personal interests or personal creative expression. And the church was never terribly distant, that double-edged sword of at the same time enabling education, but all the while carefully curating that process in the avoidance of what it took to be heresy. Of course, then as now, attention spans were meager, memory struggled in retention and parsing reliable information from blathering nonsense could prove difficult. The learning process simply took years, and it takes years, decades upon decades, to develop even a tiny niche of expertise. And I know something about that. What if there were a way to gain all that knowledge, eloquence, and an ironclad memory to retain it only in a matter of months? Well, one of the most popular grimoires or books of medieval magic claims to provide just such a rapid, supernatural acquisition of the educational gamut, the famed and denounced Ars Notoria. In its pages are a series of complex rituals, orations composed of angelic names and carefully constructed visual devices or note, which when combined in one of the most elaborate magical procedures to survive for the Middle Ages, claims to provide the operator with what it calls total knowledge. In this episode, let's explore the Ars Notoria, a form of medieval theurgy which magically serves to provide the most empowering dimension of human existence, the power that is education. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, make sure to subscribe and check out my numerous other content on topics and esotericism, included curated playlists on various topics. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in Western esotericism here on YouTube for free, I'd hope you consider supporting my work on Patreon with the super thanks that I now have available down below or with a one-time donation via PayPal. Again, you can find those links below and your support of this channel is the only thing making it possible, so thank you. And now, let's turn to the Ars Notoria and the magical rituals and notai, which are said to bequeath total knowledge to the magus. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. The origins of the Ars Notoria is, like most grimoires, rather mysterious. A similar kind of magical education acquisition literature is also known to exist in the rabbinical world. This is the Sar Torah operation, in which one summons the Prince of the Torah, hence its name, to immediately gain the gamut of rabbinical and Talmudic wisdom. And in even more remote antiquity, there is a tale in which an ancient Egyptian priest magus gains immediate wisdom from a magical papyrus by dipping it into beer and water and 
drinking down magical papyrus beer. The earliest manuscript of the Ars Notori that survived actually appears to have been produced in northern Italy, or I think more likely northern France, sometime around 1225. Interestingly enough, this also coincides with several other important historical factors. The first, of course, is the foundation and expansion of the then nascent University of Paris and its illustrious faculty of theology, which was already becoming notorious as a bastion of heterodox thought through the 13th century, with the practice of both sorcery among its students, which was eventually officially condemned in 1389, and the faculty, along with the rise of radical averroism leading to the condemnation of 1277. Again, if you want to learn more about the medieval sorcery practiced and then later condemned at the University of Paris, you can check out my card on the episode on that above. Another important aspect of this is the education for the newly upwardly mobile clerical class. This emergent bureaucratic and mercantile class required an education, but really only a secular rather than a fully religious education. They didn't need to know all the priest and scholastic stuff. Thus, a rapid acquisition of the liberal arts was a sine qua non then and now to enter the most upwardly mobile sector of the population. Of course, another factor here is the 13th century appearance of this manuscript of the Ars Notoria that it also corresponds to the condemnations of that very text to be found in that same century by Alexander of Hales, William of Paris, Thomas Aquinas, among other people. Such a widespread and early condemnation of the text among the theology faculty at the University of Paris specifically and the magical goal of the Ars Notoria, that is to say rapid educational acquisition, indicates to me that the origin of this text, at least in part, lie in the university milieu of the 12th century Renaissance and the 13th century flourishing of the secular university, specifically there in the world of Paris. Though, like all technological texts, and magic is certainly a kind of technology, it very likely relies on earlier texts and traditions and ideas evidenced by the presence of Greek and Hebrew terms that populate the magical notae of the text. Also, like many grimoires of this period, the development of the Ars Notoria is very complex. In fact, we might even speak about the text as a compact body of magical literature as opposed to one book. In general, the text is composed of a series of magical rituals and orations, along with a series of notae, or magical emblems populated with incantations, which are very likely angelic names, some of which have their apparent origins in Hebrew and Greek, while others are mysterious or garbled or both. In summary, the magic operates through a self-initiation and purification process, the recitation of a series of increasingly frequent magical prayers and orations, and finally the inspectio, the inspection of the magical notae, through which various domains of knowledge are magically provided for the magus. We'll unpack each of those steps in a moment, as each is rather complex. The apparent earliest strata, or version A in the modern critical edition, contains the main body of the text along with the lion's share of the note. This version, while the foundation of the text leaves much to be desired, especially on the logical and operational front, how to actually do the thing. To wit, a significantly expanded edition appeared starting in the 14th century in which a substantial commentary or gloss is superimposed upon the A version, more than doubling the size of the text and greatly expanding on how one actually uses the Ars Notoria, including some further note. Though, as one might imagine, the B version gloss also introduces its own share of confusion at points. It's also worth noting that there are derivative works in the Ars Notoria format that also appear beginning in the 13th and 14th centuries as well, including the Opus Operum, which contains further instructions for the Ars Notoria more generally, the Liber Visionum of John of Morigny, which is 
a text with its own tortured history, but actually there the goal is a beatific vision of the Virgin Mary as the culmination of the whole procedure. In fact, the Liber Visionum was developed as a kind of sanitized version of the Ars Notoria after the author, our friend John, experienced positively terrifying visions after attempting to use the text without undergoing the proper purifications. I mean, I'm not going to say you should try any of this stuff, but you should like read the instructions first. John, it's kind of your fault. You, sh you should have read the instructions. I'm sure I'll come back to the Liber Visionum at some point in the future. Don't worry, it's an interesting text. Some of the magical oration language was also taken up into the Liber Ioratus, which is another interesting text I'll get to, and the Ars Paulina, which is another text I'll be covering as well, but occurs in the Lesser Key of Solomon. Finally, the Ars Notoria was printed for the first time in the Opera Postuma of Cornelius Agrippa. Yeah, three books of occult philosophy, Agrippa. Sometime in the early 17th century, the edition doesn't really have a date. There's a lot of mysterious things about that edition along with a crab bag of other books like the Heptameron of Peter Abano and some other text. This version found in the Opera Postuma of Agrippa was actually translated into English in 1657 by Robert Turner and would eventually be included in the collection known as the Lesser Key of Solomon. Now, if you've been hanging around here, you've heard Robert Turner. He's translated a bunch of this literature in the mid 17th century. Unfortunately, the Agrippa Opera Turner English translation is primarily based on the very lean version A, with a few interpolations from version B and the Opus Operum, but has several sections just removed, other sections are scrambled for some reason, and most damning overall is the complete lack, complete lack of the magical Neitai, whose inspection is the culmination of the whole operation. So much of the operational sections are missing, the rest is a bit scrambled, and it's missing the images that are the whole point of the magical procedure. Why even bother Bob Turner? Despite the poor printed history of the Ars Notoria, over a hundred manuscripts, there may be upwards of 150 manuscripts of this text that are known to survive from the Middle Ages, and the text is so widely referenced, virtually Every pre-contemporary occultist seems to have had some access to it and probably futzed around with it a bit, that it must have been well known and accessible to anyone who sought it out, despite, you know, being condemned repeatedly. While widely attested, the exact kind of magic that the Ars Notoria is, or if it's magical at all, is contested. Despite the text being framed by this wonderful tale in which the angel Pomphilius provides the magical text in the form of gold tablets to King Solomon, the Ars Notoria can't really be described as belonging to the Solomonic medieval magical literature. And that literature and the magical systems associated with it, one seeks to bind and control various supernatural creatures, including angels and demons and elementals and all kinds of things, by the use of magical incantations, conjurations, ritual attire, which is very fashionable, and a wide range of ritual furniture, magical circles and triangles, swords, bells, incense, the whole Megillah, necromancy stuff. None of these trappings are to be found in the Ars Notoria. In fact, aside from the note, which one inspects in the culmination of the operation, virtually nothing else is really needed to pull off the magic. That said, how does one even use the Ars Notoria? Well, the first section, as I mentioned earlier, is a kind of purification and self-initiation, whereby one induces a sleep vision through writing angelic names on leaves, like leaves, immersing said leaves in drinking said water. And no, the leaves don't appear psychoactive. I see you, DMT guy, in the comments interspersed with a series of pious prayers and orations following the traditional Catholic times. Oh, did I also mention that Robert Turner's English translation also tries to kind of decathlicate, decathlify, decathlicate the rituals, but only kind of and rather haphazardly, 
At any rate, during this period of fasting and ascetic purity, one will be provided a dream vision in which it will be made clear whether one can or cannot proceed to the Ars Notoria ritual proper, or if more spiritual and moral preparation are required. Also, if you do receive a dream vision, the text makes it very clear that if you share that dream vision with someone, that's a bad idea and you're not allowed to do that. So that's one of the clear prohibitions in the text. If so, the, it seems like the whole operation will get botched and maybe even worse things will happen to you. Our friend John, who wrote the Libra Visionum. And I can't reiterate this enough. This magical procedure is rigorously, even athletically Christian, specifically Catholic in nature. The fasts are Lenten in quality. The prayer cycle mirrors the prayer hours. The orations and prayers could just be lifted right out of the text and wouldn't appear magical in the least. They would just appear like normy Catholic prayers for wisdom. Aside from the mysterious angelic names and the orations and the visual notai, which are populated by angels in some later manuscripts, the text is strikingly just one of medieval Catholic devotion seeking out divine aid in the acquisition of educational virtues. But it's more than just that if one reads carefully and that's where the Ars Notoria crosses the line from just petitioning the divine with good old fashioned prayer well within the confines of orthodox devotion to heterodox magic. Specifically, the text frames the ritual procedure as a quasi mechanical in their causation. That is to say, if one performs the ritual correctly, the divine is compelled, compelled to bequeath upon the operator said absolute knowing. It's that compulsion bit that crosses the line, making the Ars Notoria something of a text of Christian theurgy, not logically unlike the pagan theurgy of the late classical world, whereby one could compel wonders and miracles, such as, I don't know, calling down gods and making them enter statues and speak in things. That's what makes the Ars Notoria truly magical. It's its compulsive power, its theurgical power to kind of make God teach you stuff. That first cycle complete, including the prayers and orations meant to invigorate and strengthen one's mental faculties and also the, the dream vision where God lets you know that it's okay to compel God to, yeah. That begins a three month period of study, more angel drinking water, and an increasingly rigorous set of prayers, fasts, and orations, which are said multiple times a day, all with a rather exacting ritual and astrological schedule, many of which are based on various cycles of lunations. Of course, during this period, one is expected to be studying the very branches of knowledge one is seeking to acquire magically. In fact, the text specifically notes the importance of students, students to continue attending lectures during this period. This again gives us a glimpse onto the, the audience of the Ars Notoria. This is a book aimed at students, unsurprisingly. By the third month, the prayer cycle kicks into high gear with what seems like the better part of the day spent in intense devotion at various points of the cycle. The apex of the procedure occurs during the fourth and final month where one goes on to inspect the various magical notai interspersed with further prayers and orations whereby all that absolute knowing is provided to the operator. The notai themselves are generally oriented around the structure of medieval education following the trivium or generals as the text has it which includes grammar, logic, and rhetoric, followed by the quadrivium, which includes arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, astrology. Though, the note also ended up being extended into things like medicine or physic, philosophy, theology, wonders and marvels, and various kinds of Christian virtues, such as chastity, justice, peace, and all, self-mastery, and silence, and of course, even more notorious, notorious magical practices, including seven forms of divination such as pyromantia and hydromantia and good old fashioned necromancy, 
included as what the text calls as exceptives under astronomy, but using figures of the generals, though sometimes with a singular or partial nota for them. Interestingly enough, while the text provides for learning things like necromancy using the ritual procedure, it forbids the practice of necromancy because necromancy involves sacrificing things to the dead, which is a, that's a mortal sin, so that's a no-no. So yeah, you can learn this stuff, but you can't, you can't do it. Generally speaking, the manuscripts contain between 35 and 41 different notae distributed unevenly between subjects, with some subjects getting only a partial or single nota, where other subjects like philosophy and theology get between five and seven respectively. Within the notae themselves are a series of verba ignota corresponding to the orations. These verba ignota are unknown words and are likely meant to be long lists of angelic and divine names, some of which are transparently, if not garbled Greek and Hebrew. Even the Arabic Allah makes an appearance, while the vast majority are completely mysterious. It's not really clear what these words mean. Of course, like any manuscript transmission, the verba ignota undergo significant, profound corruption and alteration through the generations of the manuscripts, often just being greatly truncated by the time we get to the Agrippa Opera edition. And of course, Robert Turner's edition just sort of randomly seems to cut them off for whatever reason. Regardless, the presence of Greek, Hebrew, and Arabic words hint to the likelihood of a non or at least para-Christian origin for at least these sections. Indeed, the production of the angel water, as I mentioned earlier, that the leaves which are written upon with the angelic names and dipped into the water and washed off and drank, this has a homology in rituals found in ancient Egyptian literature, as I mentioned, but also in the Greek magical papyri, where there is a mention of the consumption of water from a papyrus scroll, but also even in the Hebrew Bible, there's the idea of eating scrolls. Despite these homologies, the inspection of the notai fits very comfortably, very well within the visual culture of the Middle Ages. Indeed, the term inspection correctly carries the idea of not just to look at or to view, but also the sense of deep seeking concentration whereby something beyond what apparent is sought. One would inspect images of icons or images of saints. In fact, along with the magical verba ignota, many of the notae include visual cues as to the relation of the subject under study, such as the various aspects of logical dialectic, the geometric shapes, or the ring structure of the heavens with astrology astronomy. Of course, the intense rituals purification and the very intensive study which leads up to the inspection of the notae are all part of the ritual process by which potential knowledge acquisition as part of innate human potential as imagined by medieval Christian ideas of human nature are divinely actualized through the completion of the Ars Notoria operation. In this way, the Ars Notoria is made so much more sublime than so much of the other clerical necromancy of the period where what is sought seems mundane compared to divinely assisted or even divinely compelled acquisition of absolute knowing. I mean, look, I like magical treasure hunting as much as the next guy, but magically arrived knowledge by divine theurgy? Yeah, you can sign me up for that today. Now, this summary greatly elides just how internally complex the Ars Notoria is. It's just a mess. In fact, one contextually and logically break the text into a narrative prologue, the Flores Ori, or the Flowers of Gold, which are kind of a general propedeutic focusing on memory, eloquence, and the, the general intellect. There are the long series of prayers and orations, the figures for the trivium and the quadrivium, and additional subjects going on somehow just randomly put in about the various lunations and zodiacal timings, the 10 orations of the Ars Nova, which by the way is a kind of fast-tracked version of the Ars Notoria, just stuck in the middle of the text, allegedly given to Solomon after his own spiritual and moral failures. You could just fast-track things with the Ars Nova, along with further supplementary prayers and orations, all that in addition to the dozens of the notai. Honestly, 
the text is profoundly confusing, not even considering the fact that they have the incomplete scrambled Agrippa opera Robert Turner edition and lacking much of the development of the gloss of the B version and the, the opus operum, which also introduced their own confusions. It's not like the gloss and the opus operum make everything just transparently and logically clear. And producing a logically consistent singular system of magical practice, while possible, will necessarily involve logical and ritual compromise, but hell, what, what doesn't? It's a lot better than reading all these books. The best version of the Ars Notoria to be consulted is that produced by Veronese in their academic critical edition, which contains the most rigorous study of the text and the most complete version of the text to date. Of course, it's, it's in French and, and Latin, so there's that. So you'll need the Ars Notoria to help you with your, your Latin. There's also a fantastic article written by Veronese in the Finger edition of Invoking Angels as part of the Penn State Magic and History series, which if you're interested in medieval magic or just the history of magic in general, it's a absolutely necessary collection to have. The Skinner and Clark is also a wonderful edition and contains dozens of full color images of manuscripts, including several complete sets of the note, copious notes for making sense of the logic, logic of the text, and many, many helpful notes for the aspiring practitioner, along with an updated version of the Turner translation. Like all of Dr. Skinner's work, it's a really wonderful balance of careful scholarship with an eye to being helpful to the would-be practitioner. So it's a really nice diplomatic version. I also understand there's a totally new English edition based on the A, B, and the Opus Operum with the notai that is set to appear sometime in 2023, but I've not been able to consult that version at all. I really do hope to take a look at it when it appears. But until then, good luck with the Ars Notoria, or just read books like I am condemned to do. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge. Thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.